Good afternoon. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce our seminar speaker today. Arthur Shear Contractor is one of our own. Uh, he finished his, uh, earned his MS degree in mechanical engineering after completing his from the uh, prestigious Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai or IIT in Mumbai. After completing his master's research on the development of an ammonium sodium thiocyanate absorbing heat pump, which I think was developed by the Gas Research Institute at GRI and by Patel. Uh, Arthur Shear went on to occupy several leadership positions, including managing director of the uh, EMG in India. And more recently, and significantly, he went on to become the founder and CEO of Kiran Energy, uh, which was founded in 2010. And by 2012, it had become India's largest solar utility. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to a pioneer in the field of solar energy, Mr. Arthur Shear. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, you know, I know Scott Lab is a very worthy successor of Robinson Lab, but uh, Robinson Lab was a, was a great place. Uh, and it's been this today. I've actually met you know, colleagues and friends who were there with me in, in Robinson Lab. Uh, I had the the corner, the the northwest corner was my lab on the ground floor, open open to air because of the thiocyanate, so we broke the windows. It's very cold. I spent a lot of time running tests over there, hoping it didn't explode. So, uh, great time set. All the graduate students used to all sit in one book then. And, uh, we were, you know, we've remained good friends. And, and we were good. Okay, so, uh, my talk today is uh, on clean tech. Uh, how industry, universities, venture funds, how we all have evolved in clean tech, and where is clean tech going, and what's the opportunity for clean tech. Do I have to come back here to change? Is there anything easier to... try and stay on topic, okay? It's very easy for me to wander all over the place, especially because I'm not talking about any specific research, I'm talking about my experiences and, and thoughts, so, uh, so don't mind me if I wander off, but there is, I will reach the end. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk about myself and what I've done. I'm going to talk about how clean tech has evolved from 2000 to 2017. I'm going to define clean tech very soon. Uh, I'm going to talk about how industry has readjusted to a changing world of clean tech, okay. and how they are understanding that this is something that they have to move into and or abandon old areas for many reasons. Okay. And I'll talk about what I've seen and how research institutions have been outreaching there, and, and that gives us ideas and recommendations and approaches of how what OSU and others can do to meet this industry. So definition of clean tech, uh, as it was defined in 2010, around that time, clean tech is one, anything that generates clean energy. So that would mean really solar, wind, hydro, tidal, all of those, geothermal. So that is one area of clean tech. But it also includes the ability to store the power. So that includes battery systems, any kind of storage, uh, that is required. It also includes anything that helps you reduce the emissions, okay? And therefore, anything that reduces the amount of, you know, so it's not just clean energy, anything that reduces emissions. And with electrical vehicles and electrical mobility, it, since it's, a, it's a, a, you know, a substitution for petrol, that too becomes clean tech. So suddenly you're getting this whole area that, you know, pretty soon Apple phones will become clean tech if you realize that all becomes, when, when apps come in, is clean tech. So my exposure is, uh, starts for the company that I founded, uh, Kiran Energy. Uh, 2009, it came into fruition in 2010 and got funded. 
We have seven sobo plants all across Western India. It's only in India. Uh, all in the deserts in Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. So this is one of our plants in Rajasthan. What you're seeing is a 20 megawatts out of a 60 megawatt plant. The total size of the plant is something like 500 acres. It was put up in four months and had 700 people working in it to build it uh, over four months. So we, we build them fast, we build them quick. And that's another thing with clean tech. It's, it's also clean to do things. This is actually, oh, what you're seeing was manufactured in Toledo. These are built in America, built in Ohio modules that you see over here. And it's actually modeled completely on a plant in Arizona called Agua Caliente, which first saw the setup. The use of outdoor inverters, the use of certain techniques, methods, is actually done. These are some of our other plants. Uh, this is the one in Gujarat on the Rana Kutch. Um, this is one next to a vineyard. So we have cadmium telluride, we have cadmium silicon, which is amorphous in tandem. We also have a single axis tracker, the picture of that is here, which I'll talk more about. And uh, once you get into it, it doesn't become light engineering. We also have a 40 kilometer full line. We own our own substations and everything. So suddenly, as an entrepreneur, I thought you're building a light engineering business and you're actually building a business which is like heavy with systems and safety. You're always worried that, you know, that a new company has to worry about taking care of you know, safety, etc. Very much like a, a full power utility. When in 2010, Kiran Energy was set up, uh, for some reason, I thought it was very exciting to, to since I'm getting into technology, that why not why not go all in and do technology? So the kind of equity investors that came in were very excited by the access to the Indian market and the technology that they could prove. So Bessemer Venture Funds, which is if people don't know, is one of the oldest funds in the US, credited for the success of Skype and LinkedIn. So it's you know, good. And they had a clean tech portfolio of three companies, Biosole, Ultrasolar, CPR, your grid companies, battery companies, uh, and they were very keen that uh, by doing this, they could be licensed. Uh, New Silk Group Fund had a company called A1X, which I'll talk about. The George Kaiser Foundation had a company called Solyndra, which is quite, people who know, was a spectacular bust up of a company. Uh, so these were the guys who invested in me, hoping that you know, they get access to India. First solar uh, up in India decided that rather than put up plants in India, they just put money into our plants. So they forked over a good amount of money to be, become a joint venture minority partner. So we had first solar with us. And like I said, we modeled that plant on this. The Mahindra and Mahindra group, which, which is, as you know, if you've heard of it, is you know the well, but a big focus on, on uh, electric cars and vehicles and sustainability, but careful with their money. So they're very happy. They so, said, look, we come in with a minority, why don't we partner with you as well? So, so we've got this you know, big Indian group, big first solo joint ventures, great group of them. And then IFC Washington and Exxon was, if we're going to do project finance in Asia, why not? So actually today, Exxon Bank's largest solar loan in India is with us. You know, they took the biggest bunch on us. Sun Power was somebody who came in and, and with high efficiency PV modules and trackers, so we have tracker plants. And Sharp Japan had put up a very large plant for tandem junction, so they came in. So we, this is the merry band of people we got together in 2010 and said, let's build a business together and let's let's see how we you know we can have technology. So there's there's learnings from there, you know. Uh, seven years later there's lots to learn. You know, one thing good about innovation is it's always good to see history before you go into the future. Okay, so let me just quickly talk about some of the companies. Uh, Ebonix, uh, it's concentrated photovoltaic. Concentrated photovoltaic would mean you have a huge panel this big on a double axis, but its technology is a Fresnel prism that does a 50x concentration. Why do people do this? Because they want to save on the silicon. You, know, you spend a lot of money in, in creating optics, and obviously that's not going to work because the cost of the silicon has come down to a 20 cents module. So you know, the, what you want, what was expensive, is now cheap. So it kind of goes wrong. But, but it's a it's a big it's a big machine. 
very high efficiency, very good for Nevada and Arizona, tested very well, but uh, it was difficult. I mean, the markets were global markets of South Africa and India, and so the company did, was a little stillborn, but had a very good technology. In fact, uh, this is our plant. They, they put up these very good testing labs all over India at our plants and started getting data so they could get on-ground data. So I was very happy to accept this and put it up at my plant. And then, but they never came back and took any of the data, so <laughs> it, you know, you know like, all good intentions. This is a concentrated, I'm just talking about, about a non-photovoltaic area, which is concentrated solar power. Uh, a lot of it has come out of the US, and, and, and you should, in, when we mentioned the CSP, the Christian Trouble. One of the, the most famous one is Arriva, which bought a California company called Ostra. They uh, had a 10 megawatt X point. It's a linear federal heuristic program that they have, which moves, as you can see, moves mirrors to, to heat <coughs> a atomic fluid to a superheated position. You know, so you have a superheater and a regenerator, all of that, and that drives the turbine. And then we have done a 110 megawatt project out of it. Sun power. Now, does, does anybody know sun power? You should know, because Dick Swanson did his MS in WA in 1969 from Ohio State. I mean, the largest Indian, largest U.S. solar company was actually you know, from, from, from Ohio State. Okay. Uh, so, Dick Swanson built Sun Power and became, and now it's bought over by Total. What, what they've done, and it's a very, very good company, extremely good, if you see their innovation, um, they've focused on high efficiency. So, instead of trying to bring down costs, they just built modules. So, they have their space. So, Chinese firms may be having space, they have their space. There are many people who use some power. But if you're going to use that, then they use trackers and everything to, to, to enhance the performance of a land area. So if you're building something on an Air Force base in California, you want the most amount of power, get a high efficiency, and then put a tracker. That's what they do. They also came up with a concentrator, which they tried to do, didn't do very well. But the tracker does very well. Sharp. <coughs> in 2010, Sharp was the highest legacy or the biggest amount of installed base of modules in the world. There was no other company that had more modules installed. And they came up with new technologies. As you know, Sharp had put up a very large plant in, in Osaka. This is the size of the plant. They make all the LCDs for, for, for Sony. I mean, they, they actually make this the televisions, the, the panels, by the way. And uh, so, solar was a small part of the business. And, uh, and the decision to go with what is called thin film, which is, in, in this case, was a, a double layer, which is amorphous or micro, as opposed to conventional multi-crystalline, okay, was because for India, you have a lot of savings on things like uh, the temperature coefficient, very high temperatures, so you actually save on it. It's very good in diffuse light. And you know, India like Singapore has a has a haze around it all the time. It is maybe hot and sunny, but it's not Nevada, it's not you know, Andalusia and Spain. The, the skies are not picture perfect blue. So you, you do get, you know, the sun is not direct enough. And uh, Sharp also came up with a, a linear warranty, which was quite exciting, which is something different from the rest of the people. So, from 2010 to now, there's been a lot of <coughs> new innovations in clean tech. Companies coming, coming up with new ideas, fighting a cost curve, unfortunately, that was going down. So many people who brought in new ideas lost out, not for any other reason other than the, the fact that the cost of large production companies in, in Asia for pushing numbers down. Okay. And that happens across everything from, from mobile to So that's the size of a sharp plant that they've done. I'm going to skip this one. This is about uh, Solexa, which tried to save uh, on these, using thin silicon by using a reusable template. 
but they realized that it didn't work, so they actually changed their business model. It's now a you know, company that's been doing, doing other things. Let me talk about first solar. Sort of. it, it's in, in a land where prices are going down, uh, silicon is, is plummeting. For, for first solar with the cadmium terrain, out of one manufacturing facility, they, they were going to do many manufacturing facilities, but in, in America they have just one year to lead a very small. And the other one is in, in Malaysia. Why is it that first solar still is still right there? You know, its market cap may have taken some of them, but it's pretty much a big massive company and, and they work with Ohio State and, and you know, it's a global leader. It's got a very good high energy yield, and they keep on pushing the energy yield. Let me show you. Every year they have plans which they go out, it's a listed company, and they say, we will push it up. You know, by 2014, 2000, quarterly to quarterly results they push. In such way numbers they show yields and <coughs> it's, it was It created a very, very well documented, this is the way you need to put it up, this is the only way we enforce warranties. They, they made it tight, they made it this, and, and you respect that. You know, they're not trying to push product on you for sale, they charge a price, give you a warranty. They, they know their cost decrease target, they, they say it publicly as a place of coming down. They have an end of life policy for cadmium to right? they'll pick up models from you whenever you are done with them 25 years later. And, and they invest in large plants. By investing in us, they, they gave a confidence level to the world that they, they put their money where their mouth is. And they, that part is the Agro Caliente plant in Arizona in the desert. And they have actually taken the fight. So you have what is called the, the Chinese companies, Trina, Jinko, Canadian, J. Anwar, which is called the Silicon Module Super League, as it's called, of very large companies who, who get very good pricing. But first of all, actually, if you see, their capital has been able to fight in terms of their, their efficiencies and others with them. So, and this is as much as 2017. So it's nice to see competition coming only out of technology innovation and manufacturing competence and, and bringing down costs. Um, we work with Tesla, uh, and many of you don't quite not know, but Tesla, it does also does batteries for industry, and it's the same battery. And the cost of the battery does go down by the number of batteries they do. So the more cars they sell, the more battery. Uh, Tesla walls they sell, also the, the, the lithium ion goes down. And this is ready to be used along with the solar plant. Now, what is what I found very interesting, in fact, what I found extremely, it's not innovative to just put a bunch of lithium ion batteries together. But what is really good is the way they, they built the Sidemaster controller, the high safety standards they introduced, really good engineering, you know, I mean it's battery packed. It's going to be there for 15, 20 years in your company, in, at your site. Uh, but the best thing was they created a contractual way for you to get comfortable. Now, unlike solar panels, our battery needs replacement of parts. But they have what is agreed, and they serve people, they're firming contract. They tell you, I will be able to save your, your power, and it's not going to dip, the battery is not going to go down, and they, they deliver that contract to you. They tell you to pay more in the 10th year, etc. Et and I think that is very important. So the business model is not just technology, it's also how well you put contracts around it, how much comfort you give to companies. That, that the, the, the technology is behind a contract with Tesla. But to some extent, Tesla stands behind, therefore, what they do. So, the last two slides was to give you an idea of some of the innovations that kind of walked along with us over the last seven years, how, how they, some of it have been used in our sites. Pretty much all these have either been tested by us or actually been fully used in. Uh, while this was all going on, I also felt that, so we grew rapidly with these joint ventures and partnerships. In about 2012-13, we were the largest solar energy company in India. And therefore, uh, I took on the role to head the industry in India. And that was very educated for me, because personally, because we, we got people across the solar chain. So we now no longer said, oh, I am the developer, you are the supplier, so let's negotiate. We all sat together. We helped the government shape policy. 
Most importantly, we brought in standards. Now, in, in a lot of clean tech, step, you know, anything, whether you do wind or anything, safety standards, it's a long-term asset. But very important, the ability to, do, to ensure that warranties, performance is, is properly done. And the government has to stand it, okay? Because who else can enforce? You know, I mean, you, know, you need to show a level of criminality for giving a wrong standard. Because otherwise, who, who knows this? And therefore, but who sets the standard? So we, we jointly set together and built the standard. So the, the Indian standards that are there was actually built by us. Then developing the chain. So the minister would keep on saying, you know, we're doing all this in India. We've got 100 gigawatts in India. If we're not manufacturing in India, why can't we get inverters made in India? Why can't we make the cables in India? So off we go and we get everybody and say, why are we not bringing the prices down? How do? In India, we don't block. There, there are no anti-dumping. We, 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 it is there, but it doesn't succeed. So we don't have those trade tools. The only way you can do it is build it cheaper, better, and and you know that's that's what we've been doing. So we incentivize manufacturing, set standards, and you know we understood the whole plant reliability. In fact, uh, uh, we've had uh, people from Ohio State come over and talk with IIT Bombay about say about uh, and you know we've had sessions with the developers of technology talking about. The, the reviews of plants, how well they've done, and actually fed them back to, to, the, to the government. We also work very closely, and I personally work very closely with the Indian government to help underline India's commitment to solar energy. You know, many people feel, okay, say 100 gigawatt, everybody says everything. So, so to make yourself serious, we have we had to they put many of us in front to say, look, this guy's serious. Look, he's really doing all of this. And we work closely with the, the whole climate change summits, especially Paris. It's pretty much there when the, it was written, as well as now recently in Bonn. Okay, so the, the implementation of the whole climate accord and the, all, all of the affiliated activities around it. So it's, for me, that's been a great experience and a great feel of being something important in the world. So, at the Paris summit, uh, the Indian government and France decided to create a UN organization called the International Solar Alliance. And that is basically including companies, countries, which are what you call solar resource rich. It means there are a lot of sunshine. Uh, the rules of entry is you should be between the Tropic of Cape and the Tropic of Cancer. Okay? So certain countries, have you said so Scandinavia is a part of it? So, you know, is that the whole idea? And pretty much all of Africa is in it, okay? And it's India leading the world in saying, we've done solar, why can't we help other people, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the main focuses of that and one of the main tenets, the remits of this is to create an innovative space. And that responsibility has now fallen on my organization and we chair a group called the Global Solar Innovation Forum that brings in uh, global industry, CEOs, CTOs, as well as heads of research institutions. Uh, and it builds a building an active dialogue. It looks at developing innovative solutions, solar industry in the venture space, in the, including electrical mobility, storage, materials innovation. And the forum, it supports the ISA, but it also supports the uh, UN body of the International Energy Agency, as well as the International Re Renewable Energy Agency. Irina, as it's called. So the whole idea being is everybody gets into this because they want to, to get to know more about how they can grow and what, what's happening. So you, you create uh, industry, venture, literacy, and country alliances. So let me give you an idea of who all are in the innovation forum because I think that's now relevant to what can we do with memberships, etc. Companies like Shell, uh, it, in fact, it was announced very recently that they are looking to how can they use their petrol pumps and engine oils to service the electric. I mean, how do you use that infrastructure to wrap around the EV? Tyson Group, okay, a, a major company. I mean, you, you must have seen Tyson Group because pretty much every elevator or, or travelator is Tyson Group. Okay, see them. Uh, but they're looking at smart energy storage, and they they do a lot of chemical projects, and they 
then looking at chemical processes and trying to see how you can bring the greenhouse gases to, to zero emissions. So they are doing that. Alstom, uh, a big uh, manufacturer of turbine generators, and very importantly, pretty much all the rail networks of within is, is, uh, is looking at smart city networks. It's looking at, so you know, there's a lot potential opportunity for them to look at different types of, of as a smart city and the sustainable uh, concept. Sunpower is looking to grow the solar technology. Scania, which is equivalent to Amistar, they do big truck trailers, platooning, autonomous, seven different fuels that they're trying out. ABB's CTO, out of Zurich, wants to add on to its inverter platform. NG, uh, they, you know, they have this whole focus on B2D, business trip, which is, you know, Ohio State is a territory, but digital solar integration, charging, energy transition is very important. Then. Companies like NGO have actually pushed away their traditional coal, shut that down, sold that off, shut down the nuclear plants, taken a hit of 15 billion euros in restructuring, but are now getting into these kinds of businesses. So what you're seeing is in industry rapidly wanting to change and understand that in the energy space things are moving. Going on, Mahindra, who's launched a two-wheeler called Gen Z here out of Fremont. Very chatty, very new way of marketing, you know, Twitter marketing and, and, and positioning. Uh, and then i just announced that they're doing electrical vehicles in North America. Panasonic, who's pushing ahead to try and be the Asian sun power, a high-end. Tara Group, uh, uh, who, who signed up as to also be there with all their, their interests. Michelin. You know, I don't know if you know Michelle does a movie, has a, is a, doing a lot in, in mobility. As, as it gives them a chance now to move out of tires into a lot more. And Michelle actually works a lot with TRC and others. The IIT Bombay NCPRE, who's looking at different things. NTU Singapore is coming, the Energy Research Institute, which does many grids and, and, and Kellogg, and companies that have actually proven that Apple is another one, but you know. 100% renewable energy across the and how do they do that? Another area that has obviously been of interest has been to be the, the financing of clean tech. Because the change needs money, it needs it. So the United Nations Environment Program did a two year work program to create a complete financial system and how does it need to be done. And it was done for different countries, China, India, others. And I was you know, roped in to be a part of the advisory group. And we worked with pretty much of many of the leading institutions to do this. At the same time, we've been part of infrastructure coalitions and green bonds. And, 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 and much has happened over the years. And, and it's nice to see that a lot comes in. None of this can happen without large investments and, and large banks taking ownership of it. You, you don't want uh, finance to support. And so one of the things that I've been doing, again, to talk about my work, is working with EDHEC. I don't know how many of you know EDHEC. EDHEC is actually one of the hots, there's a call, the big uh, business schools of France. Uh, it's very well known. It's, I was just pleasant to know that Financial Times now ranks the MS Finance the number one in the world. So they have an infrastructure institute in Singapore, and they focus on understanding long-term assets and through data collection and analysis. And they do a lot of analysis to understand what are the financial principles to do with long-term infrastructure assets. And uh, so they look at you know, how does the financial world see it. Today, if you have, have a lump of gold, you'll find that there are 20 different ways of analyzing gold, gold markets, arbitrage, etc., cetera, et cetera. But if you have a, an asset that's only spent 25 years, you won't find any way of the financial markets to interact with it. You do need it. You can't have Wall Street not interacting with assets, forgetting about them. Then you're really in trouble. And my focus is to look at new technology assets, which clean tech has. And how do they? Because they're, they're, people forget about that very quickly. If, if the price of silicon has gone down, and you're still holding it, but that thing has to function. So that's an area that I've been working on as a research associate with it. Uh, so at the time, I'm getting data from all my Asian banking relationships. But then, once I get that, I need methods of analysis are already in place. And just to, I know these charts are not very clear, but some of the funny things have come to say that in an asset that works for 15 years, there are times when 
I, there's a seven-year point where people seem to forget about the asset or whether you can make money. And there's actually a point where people actually lose faith in the asset. Maybe because they're bored, you know, it's what you do, you know, you've heard of refineries going down or not making money. And how does the finance it view on returns get interact with that? So that comes to the point is where is clean tech and innovation headed? And I'm just giving you some points which, which are very recent. Uh, as a part of the Climate Summit, uh, there is something called the Business and Climate Summit, BCS, that, is, that where business meets. So every year there is a, a meeting of business and all the business leaders come together. This year it was at the New Delhi, so I was able to talk at it and attend. Uh, during Bonn COP, I mean, this is what everybody talks about. There are lots and lots of innovations. All the countries have innovation discussions, and you have professors from from Columbia, uh, from from, from you know, different U.S. universities in Cambridge, and all, all coming to discuss. Uh, the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership plays a big part of it, and then I was also on a panel discussion with of the World Energy Council to be discussed. So, what were all the points that came up? What is interesting? Some of the people felt that where innovation is going to go in energy is, is how do you move energy between countries? Okay, so the movement of energy, because you know some countries are more, and, and a lot of it came through because, I don't know if you've heard of Desertec, it's an abandoned idea or a not yet implemented idea, the whole idea was to cover North America, the Sahara Desert, with a huge project, and then power Europe. Okay, very good, and, and many companies and countries have signed up to it, and it's still alive. It's just not implemented. Maybe it'll be implemented someday. Uh, so the question was, how do you move? And funny enough, I mean, it seems that what is surprising to know is that in Latin America, this is routinely done. One country just helps another country. The grid is completely integrated. I didn't know this. And they move, they move power very quickly into each other's countries. It's important. So one is through the grid. Of course, the gas companies always talk about how they can move energy from you get an order in America, and I can send you the LNG tomorrow. Okay? That's, that's Exxon Mobil and others. They, they love to show they're like an Amazon when they supply. But even in that, there is the rapidness of being able to send energy across the world is important. A lot of talk came on to the fact that there is a need, and this comes actually from a little bit of the from the developing world, that it's not about delivering power, but actually matching demand and power whole concept of intelligent metering to, to bring demand down. You know, just because at 2 o'clock in the afternoon you need to reach a point doesn't mean you have to have the capacity to be able to power it. You can easily move that point, you can use storage to shift it, you can you can actually tone down your the thermostat from 24 to 26, no one even feels it automatically. Okay? And so if you have intelligent systems that actually say, look, I, I, I'm, the rather than have a brown up, you bring it down. We've already brought this in you know, Delhi. In Delhi, there was a privatization of the distribution system, which is 50% losses. The Tata has bought it. And it's amazing what they've done. Okay? They've managed to, to do all kinds of things. Like in the meter, they have a little black box. Now in, De in Delhi, everything is very good at how to take a big magnet or shine a hot and, and fix the meter so that they don't have to pay the bills. Good at this. Okay. This is a black box that records it, and in a court of law, actually says that you did this at this time. Okay. And Omron, which is a, you know a medical company out of Japan, they're making this. But the important thing is how they have created networks to be able to draw. And what I was surprised to know that there are about seven, eight companies in distribution, including GE and others, who work on these kind of technologies, where you have smart grids. And today, everyone has got smart grids. You know, in, in every state in the US, US follows a certain type of pattern, you, uh, Europe follows another type of pattern, okay, it depends on how you, you talk, but everyone is able to root power when required and to have the discussions. But by, by, by matching demand, by doing all this, you, you're actually being able to, to, to that, that's another big trend that's happening. The other trend that everybody seems to agree on is that while electrical vehicles will come, and the point that you made, Amin, is that there's no sense if you don't power it by renewable energy, right? If electricity, you buy an electrical car, and then after that, you charge it from, from uh, coal power, you're pretty much somehow using the, 
the game. So how do you create local solar charging for it? And the charging, and, and yet when you want, you don't want everybody charging your cars at night and at the time the same peak and creating peak. So how do you have trickle charging? How do you do that? So the whole charging technology and the way to do that and the infrastructure and it's got to do exact charging quickly is a big area to introduce. And big. Another felt is that that trans people, tra smart transits, smart deliveries, auto autonomous vehicles that deliver goods, the whole highway systems of moving things to produce from one to storage to a central terminal, doing that. You, know, you don't need to know of that. You can actually deliver directly. In other. So much of that is, is safe. So in the areas of savings, it's going to come from obviously the implementation of green energy. It's going to come from methods of bringing up power. It's going to come from electrical vehicles that use electricity. But it's also going to come from buildings and how you do this. One of the things that NG is doing here is actually to see what they do globally is how they bring down the, the heat island on a city. What they do by, by actually, you know, while the university already has it, if you do more and more cities where you don't do, you're able to do district heating and cooling, you do bring down heat. And that's a big area. Uh, and smart buildings. And the last, of course, is, is, is all kinds of transportation issues. And you know that uh, they're now moving to, to a hybrid electrical jet engine. You know, which is actually the, the last place where you, can, you, where you really want to use electricity. So that's also coming to So what, what would be the suggested approaches for a university like Ohio State and a, a department like ME? One is to have solar tech projects, programs with industry that one can work with and across generation, clearly across storage, the, the battery and flow battery already been done. The generation for the work digital, digital systems, intelligent systems that are required, and the whole integration of this, which brings in the modeling simulations, system design, uh, digital systems, for the work materials, all of which are parts of the work being done. So building a solar tech focus to, to meet industries and the knowledge base across it is one step. The next is of course smart mobility. So not just on, on the automotive side, but across the entire ecosystem, the rail transport, charging, the integration with solar, advanced fuels, combustion of advanced fuels, fuel cell vehicles, intelligent systems and all the aspects. So I was at TRC two days ago and talking of some of the things that they are doing to get ready for the changes that they are seeing in what their customers want. It's important to do that. In terms of teaching a student, a course in solar energy power plant, which covers pretty much everything to designing a large several hundred million dollar plant. Um, all the mathematics around it, all the issues around it, all the design considerations, use actual plants to, to get data, to live on it. So students get a, a complete idea of how the system functions, you know, from, from and it is designed. How you use solar resource, how you, how you apply that, and pretty much everything to do with the simulation, programming, mathematics, and, and materials that you need to do that. And actually it can be finished in a 14 week. Therefore, including how to finance it as well. Another area that is is uh, is yet with all these new tech industries and different, much of this is coming through venture investments. And there are a lot of new companies coming up. Uh, which one does charging? One does come out with different grid systems. Uh, there is uh, opportunities to study them, to work with them to do case studies with them, to understand uh, their performance, their historic, as well as be, uh, to be involved in how they see application engineering as they go into different areas and projects with them, which is good for students to, to actually get an idea of a growing new industry. Um, and that, the 40-minute mark is actually my last 
slide is sustainability in clean tech. You know, governments, and believe me, all governments, whatever you use, consumers support the inclusion of clean tech. And there is clearly an excitement of change. People don't see this as something that they've been changed or something that, oh my god, we have to, we have, we have to change all our. It's not a white to gay issue. This is, people are embracing it. Okay, this is fun. You know, we are looking forward to the days of more electrical cars and electric things. And, and who, who doesn't want to you know, be on an autonomous car one day? But another thing is, the, I don't know if you know this, but the highest uh, employer for energy in, India, in, in the US is actually so the solar. I mean, solar employs many, many more people than the rest of any energy. And solar did 30,000 new jobs only in 2017 in the US. Just to give you an idea, it's a, by far the largest employer in energy. And financial markets, they're all in. Okay? They are fully convinced that this is a good investment and a good return. In fact, financial markets are now working around, are worried about companies that, that are not all in, okay? but haven't figured out what the issues are. And therefore, there is a great opportunity for very interesting spaces of collaboration in the industry, university, venture alliances that are there. Very interesting technology and business careers, therefore, in clean tech. And these are the opportunities for, for the research and the That's why Exum and IFC and others understood how to fund the solar part. It was the foreign banks who did this first, and then the Indian banks came into it because they didn't know how to do it. We kind of helped educate them. So that was one big thing. Uh, second was, like I said, was the absence of data. So today we have a tracker. It's called a T0 tracker. And that project is very good. It has the highest capacity factor or the highest plant ratio in India. So we, you know, routinely get the award for the highest, because it's, it's in a very good zone, plus it's good tracker. But it doesn't perform that we expected it to. In the mornings, it doesn't seem to be, a, it's a, you know, a tracker is supposed to wake up one hour before the normal guy, because it's facing the sun. It doesn't wake up, you know, until the inverter. Because there's a haze, it's a, you know, in a winter morning in India, if you have seen it's very nice, it's, it's, but it's not, not good for solar. And I say you need means, but, they're, they're, so there's going to be a design. Other than that, I think the other issue is you don't suddenly realize that this is not a clean tech business. It's an it's an electrical power business, and you need to have people, standards, etc. As if you are running a power utility. And get serious, guys. It's not something that you do on a shoestring budget. You work very seriously. You take your responsibilities. You're running power at 132 kilowatts, several hundreds of megawatts. You can fry a lot of people if you you know. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for an inspiring talk. Um, I'm curious, when did you start your fundraising? You said 2010 when you started. 2010 what? April is when we started fundraising. 2008 and one month. So that, that makes my next question. Be we got Bessemer. Bessemer said, I'm signing up. This is a term sheet. Now let us, who else are you? Who can we talk to? And we, we, we actually said this deal is of 15 days. Whoever else wants to take it, come and take it. So they will. And we just sort of, everybody said we'll take it. What was it about your value proposition that differentiated you from all the other clean tech people that were approaching the same investment? 
don't want that many others. I think that was number one. Number, number two, I think uh, uh, we had gone to the government and, and got a clear view that we could get it. Uh, and it was on a, it's on a bidding basis. So, so it's not like, oh, we got it because I know the government guys. No. Uh, I think also the truth is that we are a professional clean company with uh, clean tech clean, but uh, you know, with, with relationships with good tech clean guys, with, with, with mentor and mentor, and, and advisory board of some very strong stalwarts. So everybody knew that this is, although a utility business, it's not going to get dirty. So I think that was the reason we stood out. I mean, we are the largest fundraiser anybody else had at that time. Yes. So a few months ago, there was a big discussion about whether 100% clean energy is possible. Anything on that? In the world for a company or what do you mean? I mean like uh, there was a, some paper saying that you can generate 100% clean energy uh, but the assumption was that you have some storage system either lithium ion batteries or pumped hydro uh, but then there was some other refutals coming along that it's not possible so you have to still have some coal okay. So, to okay. balance. so actually, okay. one of the biggest, best kept secrets in the world is that a country does not become a developed country until 25% of the power more is nuclear. Look at all the top developed countries, Canada, America, Japan, Germany, France, UK, you know, Russia, uh, the whole security council, everyone is over 25% nuclear, or fleet of nuclear, nuclear is clean. So that's your base load, okay? You know, I know people talk of Fukushima, everything, but in the end, now Japan and all can move on, right? I mean, you know, they've, they've reached the position of, they, they can move on. But uh, in, in India, we have the debates and say, oh, we should be worried about nuclear. And say, yeah, sure, if you don't want to do nuclear, forget about being a developed country. Because that's so, the biggest thing is the biggest power block is nuclear. Then you have gas, okay? Uh, then you have huge amounts of solar energy. So to answer you, you don't need storage if you've got a nuclear going 100% of the time. So I don't think storage is the answer, to tell you the truth. It is about matching demand and sticking to it when you put it on. Um, if you go to Germany, uh, I, and I was, I was very good friends with the second largest German generator, I mean what we're going to see is huge 2 gigawatt plant sitting idle over there, only 10 cars parked in the parking lot plants down. But a cloud comes over Germany and the solar goes down. He gets a phone call. He has to start a two gigawatt plant as a peaking site. It's, it's a thermal power plant. It's never meant to be peaking. And that's what it is. When I met him, the plant manager said, you know, those expletive solar companies. And luckily, he, he, he didn't realize my card said Kieran Energy because it's a solar you know. <laughs> so this is the situation with coal today in many, many so, and, and it's, it's like this, they, are the, they seem to be the guys who are going to follow the table. Because there's so many other opportunities. So, I think, I think you don't need to be on this, this hydro, you know, there's, there's so many other types of energy already there. Well, you know, with solar, uh, one of the challenges that always comes up, especially with urban areas, is land use. That's why most solar facilities What's are roofs? Or roofs, right? So, uh, could you comment on sort of the uh, technological and regulatory barriers in setting up uh, production facilities far from, or you know, somewhat away from urban areas, and then transmitting over long distances? Yeah. So, so one thing about the strength of the grid globally, if, even in, in an urban area, the grid can absorb. There's no problem at all. Because the grid balances itself, right? When you inject into a grid at one point, it doesn't mean that all the electrons flow from there to here. It just, it just means there's a the grid. The grid is a living organism in that. It's a network. So you know, that's not a problem at all, OK? It, it's a different thing when you don't have access into a point. So I, I don't think that's a problem at all. You, 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 can, you can inject 100 miles away, and it's not a problem. And any challenges with regulations or educating local communities in terms of transmission of you know, high voltage, high power lines over long distances? No, that's that's yeah, So one of the, to answer one of your questions is, we started off also trying to 
And we actually sell power to companies as well. So people have this concept of going 100% during the daytime because they work with us. But initially, in the first few years, when we were trying to talk to people, we had questions. People said, but your solar energy, you know, is it the same as regular energy? <laughs> you know, is, do you have the same sign code? Do you, is, it, is, is, it, is it a different type of energy? So no, it's, it's, it's electricity. Um, so, <coughs> no, so I think the, once we eject, the regulations are pretty much the same. Uh, I guess my question is more philosophical. Um, obviously, the financial sectors are in 100% rate. Renewable energy is economically efficient now. Is it worth even trying to fight the public uh, opinion debate then about whether clean versus... I see a lot of press right now trying to say, oh, we should be in these clean technologies for the health of the world. Is it even worth fighting that debate anymore, or is it a move point because we're moving to renewables because of economics anyway. I think your answer is that in the end, who's going to pay more for non-renewable, right? I mean, needs to pay more for renewable, right? There's a subsidy and we would do this. But why would you do it the other way around? So, in fact, uh, in India, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. In India, because all the large companies want, are very keen to show their renewable footprint, they are the ones who, who take buying more. So it's become now fashionable for all the large Indian companies to buy renewable energy directly from for people like us. Okay. So the utilities are saying, you're on my top clients, no problems, and you're taking them away. So guess what? They, they've, they've, they put a charge to make it more expensive to get solar energy to them. So it's fun. <laughs> but that's not because of the, the type of power, it's because the utility says, hey, uh, who's going to buy my power now anymore? There was a question. Sorry. Yeah, Bob. Wow. Uh, if we see, like, most of the examples that you took were, like, you know, large corporations which are getting into solar power generation or things like that, most of the world is uh, developing and a lot of small and medium enterprises, you know, feeding into the economy. and. What, what are the incentives that the government are providing these uh, companies? You know, so you, you saw my last slide, okay? You saw I said university, industry and venture. I think, totally agree with you that much of the excitement, much of this is actually coming from the new ventures. They are the ones, just like Uber and others, who are coming up with applications, business models, which could tomorrow become the way. And in fact, that's one of the things on the Solar Innovation Forum is that at every meeting, we try to encourage all the venture companies to come around so that the big companies can meet them, see them, buy them, invest in them, whatever it is. And that is actually the And it works for everybody, right? I mean, because you do need big corporate might who wants to do this, and you need a big brother who can, you know, these guys will love the most. I don't think there's a regulated framework. I think just like many of the, it, it has now become an unregulated business. Oh, what regulation is there in energy? No longer, as long as you meet standards, I don't think it's a regulated market at all. Oh, my, my question was more towards like how these SMEs can you know adopt uh, you know renewable resources like maybe you know have a solar panel on their oh, on their you know, and like, like how, how and how feasible it's is totally it scalable, for them? One, in terms one thing of good about so, solar is it's it's scalable. You you, you can you can do two panels, you can do three panels. Different. That's something we've seen all over the place. Jeff, I've never been to India, so I don't know what the source of the haze is, but here's a hypothetical. So, if the haze is due to energy use uh, from non renewables, will the haze uh, increase at a rate that uh, degrades solar to the point no, where... No, I, I, I don't think that it's just from energy. I just think it's a, it's a soil condition, okay? It's also because, you know, you get, you get a little bit of, uh, you know, in winter months, you, 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 you have uh, warm weather's gone, it's cold weather, uh, you know, that picks up some of the dust. It's kind of inversion effects and stuff. So the Sahara would have similar yeah. issues? Yeah, because where we are, are, are so far away from any industry. We're right in the in desert. It's very beautiful land right out there. So 
I can't say, I don't see pollution coming there. <laughs> Were there issues with the other aspects of weather, like sandstorms, the breaking of the, the solar? So that happens. The glass, yeah, glass so, so, when you have it. was a practical problem. Yeah, so the plants are designed. I mean, the, the biggest thing the plants are designed is not for that they sink it, that they don't get lifted up. Because after all, you're talking about one big airfoil sitting right there. You know, someone can just pick it up and go boom. And yes, I mean, we've had some really bad things. I've seen plants where the entire frame has remained behind, but the modules got sucked out. Whoa! And you're talking flying. So yes, it happens. But that's only in some kind of calamitous storm. Sandstorms happen. When you're in the desert, you have to be very careful that you stay away from very sandy soil. So you you stay in areas which are desert but not sandy. So, so then to follow up between the tropical plants and the tropical plants, yeah. there are still regions that are soil enriched from the source, but potentially not the right environment to place these. Is that no, so look, I, I don't think it's not the right environment. Uh, if, if Germany can have some solar, if UK can have solar, if Canada can have solar, if you want to read them have solar, they have capacity factors so low because they don't have sun. Mm -hmm. So you know, if, if you have a one percent loss because of sun, you know, you, you, have, yeah. you have half the power there. So I think it's just a question of how you clean it. So people have found ways to. I mean, India also that gets uh, so it's 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 doable. Keeping a solar plant clean is not so difficult. Probably it's a it's a compressed spray. You know, some people have automated it, and don't forget it rains as well. Mm -hmm. So that's you, you get one rainfall and like you have two months of saving of no cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> to, to follow up on that question about the environment, our president has withdrawn from many of the accords that you have listed there in the presentation, and is champion and champion champion coal over all all renewables. Te technically, the, the the withdrawal happens 30 days after the next election result. That being said, the so environment the, the, is not there's, there's a, there is a notice period. <laughs> so, either way, the environment is not conducive to renewables in the country today as it was a year or so ago. So, how do you respond to that different type of environmental challenge? I, I question your first part. If, if in 2017 you've added 30,000 new jobs in solar, and it's the highest thing, so why do you say it's not going to so? Because our president I mean, says it's not. Sorry. Uh, do you know that you, uh, the US is putting up 10 gigawatts of solar this year? So what are you talking about? <laughs> it's all going on. And, and solar is not something, oh, I, I planned it three years ago. It's something you put up. You decide in January, you start putting it up in, in March, you finish putting it up by August. It's, it's a fast business. I think. And people just will go ahead with it. I think one issue though is that it, it is uh, unfortunately what you mentioned as being the biggest employer in the energy business being solar. Those are well kept secrets because these are not things you hear in the meetings. So it's in the forms of the time. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to talk to a lot of this next region. Any other questions? Stay up.